I just started recording. So why don't we be begin? And if more people come in, they can join us as they get here. So welcome everybody to our afternoon class of what is Jewish cuisine with our very own Barbara Wasser. We are very excited about your lecture this afternoon. Barbara worked in kosher catering for most of her life and she published an award-winning cookbook. So please begin, Barbara. <laughs> Thanks very much. So happy to see everyone here. Um, I, I wanna take a personal uh, privilege of wishing my sister and her husband, Bob, Janet and Bob Corrin, a happy 51st anniversary today. So thanks for coming, Janet, and spending a little bit of time with us. Janet lives on the west coast of Florida. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, the history of Jewish food and what is Jewish cuisine. Um, I'm probably going to ask a few questions. We have a chat box. So please answer the questions in the chat box. And then Alana um, will graciously um, read them and then we'll respond. Um, we have a lot of people on, we're up to 48 people and uh, that's amazing. And uh, so if we opened up the mics to everybody, we'd have a free for all and nobody would hear anybody. So we'll, we'll try it this way. This is the first time we're doing it uh, on this format. So this is what we'll do. Um, so my first question before we even get going too much is what comes to your mind when someone says to you what is jewish food what is jewish cuisine what does it mean to you what are you putting in the chat let's see some information in the chat what are you thinking somebody said soul food okay Liliana, all the way from Buenos Aires. No, Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> Laura says the kind of food my grandmother made. Phyllis says my grandma. Helene says Jewish food. Gefilte fish, chopped liver. Scott, that's my son. Scott says my food, mom. <laughs> Kugel. Kugula. There are probably a million, a million ways to say Kugel. Kegel. The Philadelphians say Kegel, right, Rhoda? Melinda's coming in. Let's see what Melinda has to say when she gets here. Nobody said Kashrut. We had some other comments cholent kala eastern european food brisket ashkenazi eastern european cooking okay it gives us a wide range of what we think is jewish cuisine it always bothers me when someone says, I'm not Jewish, but I love Jewish cooking. What do they love? They love brisket. They love latkes. They love lox. They love bagels. Who knows what they love? So that's kind of, kind of um, <clears throat> what people are saying. At any rate, Jewish cuisine is influenced by what was eaten in the many countries where Jews have lived. It refers to the cooking traditions of the Jewish people worldwide. It's evolved over many centuries, shaped by Jewish dietary laws, kashrut, Jewish festivals, and Shabbat. Shabbat traditions are a big part of Jewish cooking. Jewish cuisine is influenced by the economics, the agriculture, and the culinary traditions of the many countries where Jewish communities have settled and varies widely throughout the whole world. There are many distinctive styles in Jewish cuisine, Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Mizrahi, Persian, Yemenite, Indian, Latin American, 
And there are also dishes from Jewish communities in, from Ethiopia all the way to Central Asia. Since the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, and particularly since the late 1970s, an Israeli fusion cuisine has developed. Jewish Israeli cuisine <clears throat> has especially ad adopted a multitude of elements, overlapping techniques and ingredients from many diaspora Jewish culinary traditions. Israeli Jewish cuisine is both authentically Jewish and usually kosher and distinctively local Israeli, yet thoroughly hybridized from its multicultural diaspora Jewish origins. The laws of keeping kosher have influenced Jewish cooking by prescribing what foods are permitted and how food must be prepared. The hearty cuisines of Ashkenazi Jews was based on centuries of living in the cold climate of Central and Eastern Europe, whereas the lighter, sunnier cuisine of Sephardi Jews was affected by life in the Mediterranean region. Each Jewish community has its traditional dishes, often revolving around specialties from their home country. So I ask you, where were your ancestors from and what foods were special in that culinary tradition? How about going to the chat and putting some things in so we can talk about them? First thing is, where were your families from? Russia, Belarus, Poland, Russian, Lithuanian, Hungary, that's where mine were from. Ukrainian, more Poland, the Alistok. Okay, and from your country that you remember from your Bobby maybe or from your mother, what what foods were very special from that country? Crepola? Okay. What else? Latkes, sure. You know, potato latkes were the thing, and now we have so many different things. Uh, in my cookbook, Divine Kosher Cuisine, uh, we have a, a, a corn and, and scallion latke that is just absolutely wonderful. So, you know, lots of fun things to do. Cold soups. My sister and I were trying to find the recipe that my mother used to make for a cold um, cherry soup. Um, it, it was definitely Hungarian. Uh, she talked about it um, a lot. And she made it a lot because we had sour cherry tree uh, in, in one house. Um, and neither one of us can really recreate it to taste it. So we've, we've, been, we've been playing around with it, but we'll come up with it. Anybody have that? We'd love to hear you. Kasha is the best. <laughs> That's my Scott. Okay, the Bible talks about bread, grains, and legumes as being the primary foods consumed. Meat, milk, butter, and cheese were not mentioned as much. Figs and grapes appeared to be the common fruits mentioned. Wine appears to be the most popular beverage, and it was made from grapes, but other types as well. Most food was eaten fresh and in season. Fruits and vegetables had to be eaten as they ripened and before they spoiled. People had to contend with periodic episodes of hunger and famine. Producing enough food required hard and well-timed labor, and the climatic conditions resulted in unpredictable harvests and the need to store as much food as possible. Thus, grapes were made into raisins and wine, olives were made into oil, Figs, beans, and lentils were dried, and grains were stored for use throughout the year. The cuisine maintained many consistent traits based on the main products available from the early Israelite period until the Roman period, 
even though new foods became available during this extended time. For example, sugarcane was introduced during the Roman period and rice was introduced during the Persian era. During the Hellenistic period, as trade with the Arabian nomads called Nabataeans increased, more spices became available, at least for those who could afford to buy them. Mediterranean fish was imported into the cities. Bread was a staple food, and in the Bible, the meal is designated by the simple term to eat bread. So the rabbinical law ordains that the blessing pronounced upon bread covers everything else except wine and dessert. Bread was made not only from wheat, but also from barley, rice, millet, lentils, etc. Many kinds of fruits were eaten. There was a custom to eat apples during Shavuot while specific fruit and herbs were eaten on holidays and special occasions, such as Rosh Hashanah. Children received nuts and roasted ears of corn, uh, ears of grain, especially on the evening of Passover. Olives were so common that they were used as a measure. Meat was eaten only on special occasions, on Shabbat and at feasts. The pious kept fine cattle for Shabbat but various other kinds of dishes, relishes and spices were also on the table. Deer also furnished meat as did pheasant, chickens and pigeons. Fish was eaten on Friday evening in honor of Shabbat. Eggs were so commonly eaten that the quantity of an egg was used as a measure. Emphasis was placed on drinking with the meal as eating without drinking any liquid causes stomach trouble. Maimonides in his Safer Refluot mentions dishes that are good for health. He recommended bread baked from wheat that is not too new, nor too old, nor too fine. Further, the meat of the kid, sheep and chicken, and the yolk of eggs. Goats and cow's milk is good, nor are cheese and butter harmful. Honey is good for old people. Fish with solid white flesh meat is wholesome. So also are wine and dried fruits. Fresh fruits, however, are unwholesome. I have trouble with that. And he does not recommend garlic or onions. How come Maimonides knew that garlic and onions were not good for digestion? Hmm. How many of you could cook without using onions or garlic? Show of hands. <laughs> oh yes, Ken, no onions, no garlic? In the United States in particular, Jewish cooking and the cookbooks that recorded and guided it evolved in ways that illum illuminate changes in the role of Jewish women and the Jewish home. Jewish cuisine has also played a big part in shaping the restaurant scene in the West. In particular, in the UK and US, Israeli cuisine in particular has become a um, leading food trend with many Israeli restaurants now opening up sister restaurants in London and beyond. Regionalization has added to the unique features of Jewish cuisine. In the 1930s, there were four Jewish bakeries in Minneapolis within a few blocks of each other, baking bagels and other fresh breads. Jewish families purchased halalos for the Sabbath meal at one North Side bakery. There were two kosher meat markets and four Jewish delicatessens one of which began distribution for what would become Sara Lee frozen cheesecakes. Recently, I learned that Jew the Toronto Jewish community has a special called blueberry buns. I don't know whether we have any Canadians on today, but we'll get them to talk about it. And they are only available in Jewish bakeries for six weeks in the summer when blueberries are available. Montreal, on the other hand, is noted for smoked meats, although most of us would think of the delis of New York should be noted for them too. With kosher meat not always available, fish became an important staple of the Jewish diet. In Eastern Europe, it was sometimes especially reserved for Shabbat. A fish is not considered meat in the same way, although some, Fardi some Sephardim do not mix fish and dairy. Even though fish is parv, when they are served at the same meal, Orthodox will Jew, Jews will eat them during separate courses. First the fish, then wash the dishes or replace them, and then the rest of the meal. The combination of smoked salmon or whitefish with bagels and cream cheese is a traditional breakfast or brunch in American Jewish cuisine made famous at New York City delicatessens. 
Since bread is the staff of life, and even in ancient times, every meal included bread, modern Jewish families make sure that challah is on the dinner table on Friday night. Since the pandemic, it appears that more and more people are baking their own bread, and of course challah is included. Supermarkets were out of flour and yeast as supplies dwindled because of the rush to stack up and bake breads. I even baked a challah for the first time in many years. So with a show of hands, how many of you been baking bread or challah during this pandemic? Can we see a show of hands? I don't know whether we can with 72 people, we only see 40 at a time. How many do we see at a time? About 40? So, 25. Yeah, or 20, 25. Okay. Um, so, you know, that's, that's very interesting. So, Alana, do we have any questions um, ab about Jewish cooking, um, or do we have some comments that we would like to share in the chat from the chat box? I don't have any. If anyone would like to, please add them to the chat right now, and I'll read them. Or even if they want to raise their hand, and you can unmute on you one person at a time. Sure. Yeah, schmaltz, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, <clears throat> Nancy just said schmaltz uh, and gribbonus. Um, and, and, you know, we all stopped making it for a long time because they said it wasn't good for you. It was, I don't know. I still do it occasionally when I make chopped liver. I think it needs the schmaltz. But in my cookbook, Divine Kosher Cuisine, we have a recipe for veggie schmaltz. And, um, I defy you to uh, make it and smell it and say it isn't really schmaltz. So it can be used uh, uh, for dairy meals. You can make a, 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 um, a, <clears throat> a mock um, chopped liver spread with peas or something like that and use the veggie schmaltz and it gives you the same schmaltz flavor, which is kind of interesting. Okay, where are we? I can't. Um. um, Goldie, let me unmute. Let me unmute Goldie, and then we'll have Janet after Goldie. Let me just okay. unmute Goldie. Good. Go ahead, Goldie. Oh, no, you're muted again. Unmute yourself, Goldie. Mute. Am yeah. I okay? You're fine. Okay. Right. Um, I remember my dad, may he rest in peace, would love pacha. And I remember hating the smell of it even. Like I would leave the house when my mother was cooking it. But it's an aspect made with calves feet. And right. it, it was um, something my mother made in the wintertime all the time because my dad loved it. Um. That was not part of my tradition for, for whatever reason, I don't know. But um, the, uh, maybe it's more Russian, do you think, or Polish, uh, Goldie? I might guess Polish. Mm -hmm. And probably from an economic point of view, a lot oh, of the dishes that I remember my mother making um, was based on economics, what they had. Right. And so, um, you know, you weren't using top grades of, of beef or things of that nature. Even gefilte fish, as a young child, my mother used to fill pieces of fish. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a fillet kind of thing, the way we look at it in a patty. It was a whole fish that was filled. Right. So, uh, you know, the, even the term gefilte means stuffed. Stuffed fish, gefilte stuffed fish. fish. Sure. So that's really what I remember as a child. Great. Anyone else like to uh, speak? I'm going to unmute Janet now. OK. Hi, sister. Unmute yourself. Make sure that your mic is unmuted. No, can't do it. Go down to the bottom where the mic is. I just there you go. Okay, yeah, the, the uh, mine was not working, but 
then one came up. Um, I'm just thinking about all the fatty foods that were in our diet and how we still live to ripe old ages and eat, eating that stuff. Um, you know, the brisket and the, the uh, veal breast and et cetera. You know, all very fatty foods. Pastrami. <laughs> right. Well, um, duck is something that I remember, um, and that was before Janet was born. Um, my grandmother, lived with my grandmother for a while, and my mother and I, and um, I remember the, the goose was out in the backyard, and she fed the goose before Pesach, and then it was taken to the Shafet uh, for the Pesach meal. So that, that's something that has stayed with me forever. Any next? Anybody else like to share what they, what they remember from their childhood? Helene, do you want to share? I'll unmute you. Great. Uh, this is not about my childhood so much as I had, my family never made chunt, cholent. And I didn't even know what it was. And when I got married, my husband said, it was his favorite meal and his mother and his grandmother used to make it quite often, you know, for Shabbat, for lunch for Shabbat. And uh, the first time I had it, it was horrible. She made, later on I had other recipes that were good, but I wondered how common this particular way of cooking chocolate was. Um, she would put the potatoes and the beans in layers, you know, and onions and garlic, and then a, a very small amount of meat in the bottom of all this, seasonings. But on the top, she took huge chunks of fat, beef fat and chicken fat, just solid fat, put it on the top, filled it up with water, and then did the cooking for 16 hours on a you know, slow temperature, but it felt like lead going down. It was horrible. <laughs> and so I never wanted to eat it. But since then, I've eaten other recipes that taste pretty good. It's not my favorite thing. But is that a common, you think a common way? She was, she, uh, was, she was brought up in a, in a uh, small shtetl, I guess, in Poland and came here when she was about 13. But that's the way she said they all made it where she right. lived. Well, um, from my Hungarian background, my grandmother made cholent, so Hungar it, it came out of Hungary as well. Uh, again, it's what Goldie said, uh, was because of um, trying to keep the prices down uh, and, and uh, be able to feed your family um, without spending too much money. Um, but my grandmother used to take um, the skin of the chicken and make what she called helzel, which is, um, which yeah. I'm sure some of you remember also. And, um, and so that was, that was how um, we, ha we had, uh, we had cholent. Uh, with a show of hands, how many of you were brought up with cholent? Not very many. Yeah, well, I had it, but then Janet didn't, well, she's younger than I am, so. <laughs> okay, who else? Thank you, Helene, very much. Goldie again? Unmute, uh, okay, wait, uh, Alana has, I don't so know. In the, so in the chat, I just wanna say that Nancy wrote, eggy and chicken soup from ch fresh chicken. My mother would cook the feet also. Sue yep. wrote chopped liver with, Gribbiness and and I will unmute Goldie. Okay. Goldie, unmute yourself now. Okay. There you All go. Right. 
I mean, a lot of things. I laugh about things. The Orthodox community, by the way, still makes chulun quite often for Shabbos because you leave it on the stove for the duration of Shabbos so you can really have a hot meal during the Sabbath without actually cooking. So my granddaughter last week was making chulun's and she uses a crock pot. So a little bit different than the Europeans did it years ago, but it's still done basically the same ingredients, maybe a little bit different spices involved and stuff like that. But basically it's beans and potatoes and some, some form of meat. The helzel you mentioned, Barbara, helzel mm -hmm. actually means neck. Right. And my mother used to take the skin of the neck and fill it with stuffing. And right. Use it like in ro with roast chicken, but that was almost like a stuffed derma. Exactly. It was the skin of, of the chicken. My mother-in-law, who came from Romania, had a different style of cooking, though. And I remember when I was first married, she taught me how to make potato pierogin, which I had my mother never made. But she used the starch water to make the dough. Oh. So it, I mean, everybody had their own little technique and their, right. their little tricks to it. But um, I laugh at myself even um, as a young woman, I try to make um, preploch and I try to make the dough. And I called my mother up and I said, what am I doing wrong? The dough keeps snapping back. I can't roll it out. It keeps snapping back. And she said, how many eggs did you put in? Mm -hmm. And I don't remember what it was. She says, you're using too many eggs. Stop using so many eggs. But again, you know, this was based on economics. Would they waste so many eggs on dough? So oh, it, it was right. all part of the same thing. Sure. Sure. I and think Frida has her hand up. Uh... I will unmute her. And I just want to mention that Laura put something interesting in the chat. She said, that the crock pot was originally created by an Orthodox Jew to make cholin. Sure, sure. Good, Laura, thank you, that was great. Um, um, talking about, just before Frida goes on, just talking about pierogi, I just would like to tell you that we have a, a wonderful memory in our family. Uh, Steve's grandfather lived to 92. When he was in his 80s, um, I remember he, make, he, he came to Schenectady to my mother-in-law's and he made pierogi. Um, so that was, um, he was from um, basically the Ukraine, uh, the south of Poland. So it, it was indigenous to that also. Okay. Yeah. One of my earliest memories and, have to do with challenge. What, are you ready for me? Or you have yeah, else? sure. Yes, we're ready. One of my earliest memories because remember, I was born a long time ago. One of my earliest memories was on, uh, on, a, on Thursday, going to the market with my mother to the fresh chicken market, where she would pick out a live chicken. They would call, kill it for her. And then we went in the back and plucked out all the feathers. And the reason I went with her is because I love to sit there plucking the feathers. And I can remember that so clearly. That was our time together to sit in the back of a chicken market plucking feathers because every Friday, of course, we had to have chicken soup. That's what we had. The other thing I wanted to say was a lot of what we're saying is, is really a culture of poverty since we weren't, you know, in my family, we were very poor, but even the people who came from Europe and um, the re we had, a, you, you had, and, the, and we had large families that were large families. And so we had to do the kinds of things where you could feed a large family with very limited resources, which is why we had to have chicken soup every week, which is my, why my mother made the best pot roast in the world. And where my mother, who was born in the United States, we are six generations in our country, my mother never in her life made a roast beef or a steak. Or, she just had no idea how to do that. Everything that we, that her cooking was geared toward feeding a large family with very little money. And I must say it was awfully successful because I remember having wonderful, wonderful meals. Mm -hmm. Never cholent though. On Saturday during the day, we had cold. We had leftover chicken from the night before and that, that was cold. But I'll never forget plucking chicken. And I have to tell you one other thing because many years later with my uh, Italian mother-in-law, we went to a, a, chicken, a chicken store and did exactly the same thing. 30 years later, we sat in the back plucking the chickens from the <laughs> Of course, they had the culture of poverty also. 
anyway, that's what I wanted to say. And Melinda's next. Okay. Hi, everyone. So a couple, I want to get back to the Pacha that Goldie mentioned. I have a very funny memory of, I loved Pacha, loved it. Until one day I was about nine years old and I asked my mother how to make it. Uh, and as soon as she told me what it was, I never ate it again. And just the thought of it now, I get nauseous. But I remember <laughs> until that point loving it. I want to just say about Shulent. Shulent has had a rebirth in the Shabbat menu planning. Shulent is no longer considered the poor man's food. I make it often. By the way, the cleanup has gotten so much easier by using these cooking bags in the crock pot so that when it's left over, you just pick up the bag and the crock pot itself is You're clean. Um, but people now put spare ribs in them, uh, pieces of brisket or flanken. Mm -hmm. It's gotten, you can make cholent a very expensive, expensive way. And I wrote in the, in the uh, chat <clears throat> that one of my grandchildren has celiac, so she can't have any kind of like barley or any of those things my daughter now puts in quinoa oh. and it's like a new resurgence of chulent so potatoes quinoa instead of the barley which is so good in chulent um but it, it's a good replacement and she'll put rice in she can have rice well quinoa, so that's quinoa i think has become uh very popular in in all kinds of uh yes of yeah yes Thank you, Melinda. Thank you, Helene, Barbara, for doing this. Helene Herman is next. Hi. Yes. <clears throat> Not to be confused with Helene Norman. We both serve on the board of Temple Beth Torah Sharae Tzedek Sisterhood, so people confuse us all the time. So my grandparents live next door to each other. And Bubby and Zadie were from the Ukraine, and Grandpa and Grandpa were, were, were split. One was Lithuanian, the other was Polish. And the food was very, very different. I remember when I got married, my oldest born grandmother gave me uh, a bottle of sour salt to use in stuffed cabbage. And you had a lot of sweet and sour food. Um, the Russian family really didn't have that. And I found that a lot of the, um, the ingredients, everybody used garlic. You always had, the, everybody what? used garlic. I, everybody used garlic. I always had the smell of garlic, but as far as some of the other spices, my grandmother could not cook without paprika. And she, again, she was the Polish grandmother. The other thing is, you know, most of American Jewry come from um, Eastern European stock, whether it's Romanian or Hungarian, you know, we're mostly Eastern European. And um, I, I do programs about Moroccan Jews, which have heavily influenced, by the way, uh, Israeli cooking, the you know, North African Jews have influenced Israeli cooking, but I went to a, um, a kosher restaurant in Rabat, Morocco, and the food was like nothing my bubby would ever be familiar with. It was totally, totally different. So there's another whole side of cuisine that uh, influences the Sephardic Jews that we probably have no relationship to whatsoever as far as our heritage. Thank you, Helene. Who's I'm, next, Alana? I'm looking, it's, the easiest is if you raise your hand, like put up the hand raise button, I can see it very easily because it's hard to see every one. I'm scrolling through to see if anyone has their actual hand up. Jane Adler, I'm going to unmute you. And now unmute yourself, Jane. There you Not go. Unmute yourself because the host. Yeah, you're there. You. Okay. Just can you hear me now? We can. Okay. Just a, a little anecdote about uh, pacha, otherwise known as calves for jelly, which we talked about. Um, I was a, a teenager when I met my, uh, who's now my husband, and uh, when we started dating, his mom invited me for Shabbos dinner. And she went all out. She was a wonderful cook, all traditional Eastern European, uh, Ukrainian type of foods. And uh, her, uh, her four spice, her appetizer was pacha. And I mean, it looked very nice. She had 
carrots floating in it, like an aspic. And I tasted it and it was, to me, it was like eating glue. And uh, she said, well, how do you like it? And I said, oh, it's wonderful. What am, what am I going to say? So uh, anyway, got through the meal. Everything else was delicious. Uh, I'm invited for the next Shabbos dinner. And what does she have? She said, I made pacha because you liked it. Uh, my husband would never, ever eat it. And finally, he said to his mother, Ma, she really doesn't like it, but she didn't want to hurt your feelings. So I was <laughs> off the hook. And just another uh, reminiscence about um, schmaltz, chop, uh, uh, chicken fat. My father uh, used to uh, preggle the fat. He would make the gribbonous and he'd make the chicken fat. It was really pure and wonderful. And uh, during Passover, uh, they didn't have all these kosher for Passover foods. So he would use the chicken fat in place of mayonnaise. So I remember eating egg salad with instead of mayonnaise, it had uh, chicken, uh, chicken fat. It was really bad for one's cholesterol, but just some memories. Rhoda Sugarman is asking in the chat, um, exactly what is gribbiness? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear the question. Rhoda Sh Sugarman asked in the chat, yeah. exactly what is gribbiness? It's when you, when you render the chicken fat, um, sometimes you have some pieces of skin along with the fat when you're rendering it. So the skin becomes um, crunchy and, and, and um, I, uh, what, what word do I use? Uh, it, the gribbon is, is the skin that is left um, after you have rendered um, the chicken fat. Um, and I always put it in some skin just to make sure I have enough gribbiness in there. Does that, that help you? Yeah, Nancy is responding too, that it's a chicken skin. Scott is next. Go that's, ahead, Scott. That, that's our youngest son. Scott should be unmuted. Unmute yourself, Scott. Now I can. I was waiting for the host to let me do it. Hello. Hi. Oh, you're doing such a great job. I was just thinking that, um, well, like the person that was asking about the gribbon, that's like just like the crispiest skin that's just kind of left. It's all been rendered out, right? Yeah. But my dad, he used to tell stories about having schmaltz in a little jar in the middle of the table. And it was always there and it was always room temperature and he would just like spread it on matzah or spread it on bread or whatever. And it was like a daily nosh. But growing up, you never made that for us. And really, I think the only time you started to really shift your... Uh, you know, become a, a more modern Jewish cooker, kosher kush, uh, chef, I think is when my sister Amy became a vegetarian and you made veggie smalts. And, and that's what we use now. Like just recently, I love chopped liver, but I never made it myself until uh, last December or January when I was in Florida. And it was such a pleasure, I must tell you, um, boys and girls <laughs> sorry i'm the teacher ladies and gentlemen <laughs> to cook with this woman is such a dream and um i'm just so lucky because she's a great partner and we do really well together in the kitchen so um you know she taught me everything that i know um but there was one pesach uh and i was helping make the chocolate roll and uh I used a towel to roll it up really tight. And she was like, oh, I like that. So, you know, I'm here to learn something new from one of you. And uh, I want to just thank mom and Melinda and everyone else for doing this. 
Uh, I always thought my mother should have her own TV show. And uh, look at this, 85 years old, and you did it. I'm so proud of you, Ma. Thank you. <laughs> Liliana is next. Hi. Hey. First, I, I want to say that I finally I, I meet you, Barbara. We and Barbara, Barbara and me, we, we, are, we met at Jewish, uh, Jewish food. Jewish food. It was a group. Yes. And it was some um, 30 years ago, I think. It's about 30 years ago. What I wanted to share, because I, I, at first I didn't have a, a, a memory from childhood, it, it didn't come to me. And then I, it came, I have a, my grandparents were Bobby and Zaidi and Opa and Oma. I have Opa and Oma, Bobby and Zaidi, the, the Germans and, and the Europeans. And my Bob used to make niches at the kitchen. She has a, she had a little um, table and she had, she used to make the, the dough and to, to, to put the dough. I, I love to sit, to see her prepare the dough. And it had to be like, uh, she had to see me through the dough. I, I learned that, that to make a real niche, you have the dough it's to be so thin that you, you can see the other people through it. And she filled it in many things. She put kasha, she put uh, uh, spinach and cheese and everything. It was delicious. That was a memory from childhood, very strong, that came in. Sorry for my English. Yeah. Thanks so much, Lily. Lily and I have known each other online for a long time. I just have to tell you that um, Lily, we've known each other. And then Lily, um, we have a, re a relationship because uh, Lily's son, uh, who is a rabbi, uh, married an another rabbinical student, and it happens to be related to Marty and Susan Farber, for those of you from Schenectady. So that, that we go, go back a long time. Bennett Storfer is next. It's Linda, really. Bennett's not here. Um, I have two observations. I think Jewish food and Jewish cooking is great, but it's gotten a lot better. Nobody has mentioned um, kishka. We never had that in my house growing up, kishka. Although I think kishka killed more Jews than Hitler. It really was not a, a healthy dish. Uh, nobody has mentioned borscht. A lot of people made their own borscht that came from the old country. But I wonder if you could comment um, afterwards about the way Jewish food and cooking has changed in the last 20 or 25 years in, in the way more people, it's been said, are becoming vegetarian, but they keep kosher. And the other thing that I've observed is we have partners now. We have men that cook. Cooking is not just a women's thing. It's a creative thing. It's very therapeutic. A lot of us have been doing a lot of cooking in the last five months here, I've cooked every single recipe that I've ever cooked that I know. And my husband said, well, cook some new ones now, but there are partners. Men are really partners with us. Would you comment on the healthy part first, please? Happy to. Uh, would any, did anyone else want to talk, uh, Alana, before we do that? I'm, I'm just looking. I don't see anyone right now. I'm going through. Okay. Um, uh, one of the things that I wanted to, to mention was, and um, <clears throat> what I talked about earlier was that spices and, and seas, a lot of seasoning was not particularly used in Ashkenazi cooking. Um, <clears throat> that's not how I was brought up and that's not what I remember um, because um, my, my maternal grandmother, uh, who was Hungarian, uh, used a lot of seasoning and a lot of spices, but I think more and more we're using we're using much more uh, seasoning and spices today than we ever did before, um, and we're we're very mindful of keeping <laughs> low fat, uh, and um, and that's become um, kind of a mantra for people to try to stay away from the amount of fat that they put in their cooking. Um, the 
I, 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 two out of three of our children um, are vegetarians. And Scott was a vegetarian for a short time, but um, that, was, that went by the wayside. But his sister and, and older brother are both vegetarians and they all have vegetarian children and grandchildren. Uh, our son has uh, five, grand, <clears throat> five grandchildren now and they're being brought up vegetarian. So, but when I talk about some of the things that I'm making, they're happy to try those things. Um, and, and I, <clears throat> when, when Amy became a vegetarian and it was um, after she went on USY on wheels and um, I, I, she came home kosher at that point, yes. She came home strictly kosher after at age 15. Um, when she went to college, um, once she came back from, once she came back from her first semester of college, um, she pretty much gave up meat and became a vegetarian. And she's been a vegetarian for the, since that, since that time, she's 57 years old, she has a kosher vegetarian house. She married, uh, she was a widow for uh, 13 years. She married a man, um, about a year and a half ago, uh, who is, um, a meat eater. Uh, he has a 94-year-old mother that still cooks, and um, and so Marvin eats Marvin eats flesh. So he eats flesh with Mama, <laughs> and then comes home to Amy, <laughs> and they have vegetarian. When they go out, he he's kosher out. So when they go out, they eat vegetarian. But um, you know that I think that has become um, a standard, um, Linda. Um, that a lot of people um, are doing that now. Uh, if anyone else would like to comment about that, I'm happy to hear you. Up here is next. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I think not only for vegetarian purposes, but I know even for myself, there are a lot of uh, foods that are not kosher. For example, chicken parmesan or anything like where you're combining meat and dairy. And it's nice to have uh, alternatives that are non-dairy that you can combine with meat, like the non-dairy cheese or the not real meat, like whatever they make out of tofu or something like those chicken patties from Morningstar Farms, you know, that then you can put real cheese on it because it's, it's not meat. So um, I just, you know, and that's from a vegetarian point of view, just from the point of view of being able to make recipes that normally uh, people who keep kosher could not make. Yeah, very good point, um, Sapir. Um, when I when I go to uh, Seattle, where um, Amy lives, um, and I cook for them, um, I will uh, I will use the Morningstar Farms um, uh, crumbles or that kind of thing to make chili and a variety of things. So um, and and we're very <clears throat> when we do Pesach there, um, we do we do fish for the main course. A couple of them will eat it and some of them don't. But um, when you have 25 people at the Seder table, everybody is happy. Uh, who is next? Goldie and, and Jane. Okay. Jane is next. Let me unmute Jane and then I will, then Goldie can be next. Give me one okay. second. Jane, Okay, can you hear me? We can. Okay, um, just a comment about uh, how kosher food has changed over the years. Um, when I was younger, if you went to a kosher restaurant, it was either usually a deli or a dairy restaurant. And it was the traditional foods. Um, but now um, any kind of cuisine you want is really available. And I, I didn't realize that I uh, raised my kids in, um, it was a Jewish area, but it wasn't an Orthodox area. Everybody wasn't kosher. So um, when friends of ours moved to Teaneck, Linda Storfer will know Teaneck, um, we, would, we had friends who lived there who were kosher and we would, every time we would go with them, we'd go out to eat and we had Chinese, Japanese, you name the nationality, um, Italian, and they found substitutes. And uh, so you had any kind of cuisine you really wanted and they, it was delicious. 
um, but it was kosher. And in fact, um, I remember at one gathering in Teaneck, we uh, met this couple whose son was going to the Culinary Institute of America. At the time, I think he was gonna be the first one who was kosher and his goal was he was going to open up, you know, a very gourmet um, kosher restaurant. So interesting. Great, thanks Jane, that's wonderful. Who's next? Goldie? I think in today's world, we have access to so much, whether it's the internet or the fact that fruits and vegetables are so abundant, it's not seasonal anymore, and we can get whatever we want. So that certainly has changed the way we all cook. Right. It's just the availability of things. I also want to mention when we, the first time we went to Israel, Israeli cuisine was not wonderful, to say the least. And then as the years progressed, they, Middle Eastern food, Israeli food has become wonderful. It's really become gourmet. And it, there is such a difference in the way they cook today than they did years ago. So I think everything has evolved. Um, I think we're more cognizant of health issues and what we eat. So therefore much more um, vegetable based diets are more available to us. Um, but I think just the access of, of these various things and the fact that financially we are able to do these things. So it's really changed the way we cook and the way we eat. Thanks, Goldie. Great points. Well, Melinda's next. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay. I just want to mention that when we moved to Florida, we knew that there were 92 from Schenectady. We knew that there were kosher restaurants down here, and we figured they were mostly on Washington Avenue in Miami Beach. Since that time, we thought we were going to be able to do this thing. Our, our plan was to visit every kosher restaurant in South Florida. Impossible. If you go on the list of the ORB of kosher restaurants, because I've sent it to various people that have asked at different times, there is approximately 400 kosher restaurants. I was gonna to say to Orlando, but now there's one in Ormond Beach. From Ormond Beach to Key West, 400. They're not all you know, fast food. Some are very elegant that require, like in the old days, reservations. Um, five, six, seven course meals, and some are very simple. So the idea that kosher food is abounding is interesting, but there's also another phenomenon that I've noticed in some places like along Harding Avenue in uh, Miami, Surfside, Miami Beach. We were recently in Atlanta and we noticed this. You don't always see a sign that says very clearly kosher. And that's because there seems to be interest in attracting a non-kosher and non-Jewish clientele just to come for good food. Once you get inside or you see on the door, on the menu, the insignia that says it's kosher, there have been multiple times when I've walked in saying, wait, I thought this was a kosher restaurant, because they didn't want that to, uh, I guess, cloud anybody's judgment before they walked in. So that's another change that more and more you see this, not only in Florida or Atlanta, but in Chicago, uh, and certainly in New York City, um, Many restaurants that it's sort of, if you know that it's kosher, it's fine, but they don't glaringly advertise it. That's Great. All. Thank you. Thank you, You're Melinda. Welcome. Who's next? Um, Linda Storfer, I will unmute you. And then Frida and Helene Norman. About, um, can you hear me? Yes. A couple of what you just said, Melinda, about the restaurants. I was thinking back to where I used to live before I moved here four years ago. Teaneck, we didn't have a decent coffee house uh, with desserts that was kosher. Something like people do, they go to Starbucks for the lattes and the, you know, the fancy coffees. And then they opened up a place in Teaneck where they had, you know, that Starbucks feeling, but everybody could go there. It was definitely kosher, one of the restaurants. And another thing we didn't have, the first one, it still exists, um, was the first kosher bar 
in Teaneck where they had um, big screens so people could go in and watch football and, and baseball games, have a drink, have hot dogs, hamburgers. Our son was the um, mashkiach for that. And it really drew everybody cross, cross ages, young people, date night, um, middle-aged people. It was just a fun place and it was quite unique. And I don't see that here in Florida yet. Maybe we'll get, do they have a kosher bar or these coffee houses with that Starbucks feeling? When I told the owner of the uh, restaurant where I had coffee and dessert, I feel like I'm in Starbucks. He said to me, that's the biggest compliment you can give me. <laughs> because a lot of them are very dirty looking. About 40 years ago, when I used to take people on my tours in Brooklyn, we could never eat in a kosher restaurant in Williamsburg. It was just too dirty. We had to go to other neighborhoods. And now if you go to Crown Heights in Brooklyn, there's loads of like upscale kosher restaurants right now. Don't eat in them now though, it's the pandemic. Don't go now. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Go ahead, Frida. Uh, to change the subject, I just want to change the subject a little bit before we run out of time. I'm sure that many of you or some of you have uh, Barbara's book. And if you don't, you should have it. Because now that I'm home a lot and I'm experimenting with cooking, Barbara's book has become, I'm not going to say my Bible, it's not my Bible, but it, yesterday, Barbara, I used your recipe. You know how much I like spinach pie? Yes. And I used a recipe for spinach pie. I had okay. to revise it a little bit. I didn't have all the ingredients, right. but it came out beautifully. And those of you who have Barbara's book, it's absolutely wonderful. If you want to make some really fun, she really is a great cook. And those of you who don't have it should try to get it. It was really wonderful. Thank you, Barbara, for the book, as well as this. And I can't wait till next week when we can really, because I have to confess, I've tasted her babka out of this world. I don't want to use the word orgasmic, but that's really what it is. <laughs> Frida had an opportunity to taste. I had some tasters. <laughs> yes, and it, is the, it is wonderful. I can't wait till next week so we learn how to make it. I'm going to try it. But really, try some of the recipes in her book. Whenever you're thinking, you, I haven't made any this in a long time. And Barbara, I'm so happy with my spinach pie. I don't have to have it out in the restaurant anymore. I made it. <laughs> great. Thanks. I'm glad. I'm Thank glad you. it came out good. Great. Um, and I, I just want to say, um, Melinda followed up on Linda Storfer's comment. She said there are kosher coffee houses in Boca, Aventura, Surfside, and Miami Beach too. Great. Oh, while I, before you want, before you mute me again, my cousin Carol, as you know, uh, well, some of you know, is uh, Habaj. He's very, very ultra orthodox. And so whenever I go out with her before this pandemic, we always went to kosher places and we had a variety, all, we could always find, and was it Goldie? I forget who was, who said you could find any style of food, Italian and, and, um, and uh, Chinese and Greek. Melinda. And actually uh, my cousin Carol has introduced me to quite a lot of the cold, kosher restaurants here in South Florida. It's very easy to find really good kosher food. Alana, if there aren't any more questions, I would like to, um, to go back to something that um, it is uh, very traditional. And I'd like to read a piece from, <clears throat> from a cookbook. Um, I'm having a little trouble balancing because I ran out of power and I had to plug in. So, um, but um, the, 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 cook is, the book is called The Blessing of Bread. And um, the author is Maggie Glazer. And um, it, it is a lovely, lovely book. Um, uh, if you uh, are into uh, making challah, making bread, um, I recommend the book highly. Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, her comments. Um, and I'd like to read a portion. Um, for Jewish people, challah is not only bread. It is also a mitzvah of divine obligation with ancient roots. When making bread, we are required to separate a small portion of the dough called the challah and donate this portion to God. 
Before the destruction of the second temple by the Romans, the separated portion was baked and then donated to the local priests to help maintain them. But today the portion is burned so that no one can eat it or in any way derive any benefit from it because it, not, it does not belong to us. The separation of Hala is one of three mitzvot essentially associated with women. The, <clears throat> the, um, and, and so what I'd like to um, throw out to you is, um, and, and probably Melinda uh, can respond to it, um, is the whole practice of, of taking challah and burning it when you're making a challah. And it has to be a, a, a certain size, um, the, the, the dough has to be of certain size before you do that. But Melinda, would you like to respond a little bit to that? Sorry, I put, sorry I put you on the spot. That's okay. So it's, it's for two purposes, really. The burning of the challah before you actually bake the challah is a reminder that the temple was destroyed and with it all sacrifices of all kinds. And it's a reminder that although our daily Jewish life, especially in our lives in America, is for the most, is for the most part safe and secure, we are not complete. That Jewish history had a, had a period of time that was a disaster for the Jews that we have not recovered. There are many Jews that would say, myself included, but we have recovered mostly because of the state of Israel. And so it's been interpreted, and I like this interpretation very much, that it's a reminder, I, this is, I've added onto this interpretation. It's a reminder that no, no matter how wonderful our Jewish lives are, it could change in an instant. Look at the reason that all of us can hearken back to other countries because we had to leave, we didn't have a choice. And that we have to hold what's most precious to us very, very closely and very carefully. So for me, the symbol of burning the challah, some people would say it's to remember the destruction of the temple. For me, it's to remember the destruction of Jewish lives and Jewish history and how fortunate we are. Um, I'll say one other thing. Making challah is not supposed to be like any other kind of mean bread. You know, during this pandemic, I do not understand how the started sourdough bread has become a big thing, all kinds of bread. The process of making challah is actually a very holy act. It is not uncommon when you hear of someone who is ill or had mis mis misfortune that it is a tradition among Jewish women that you're supposed to recite their name in Hebrew with their mother's name, if you can think of it. And even if you don't know them, that you recite that name as you're braiding the challah, as you're taking the to burn, and all of your prayers for this person, for health and happiness and a good life, go into that. Now, I don't think we do that with any other kind of baking. I don't think so, like in a continual basis. And so, when you make challah, if you make it every week, I, I, I do not make it every week, but there are people that do, um, or whenever you make it, you're supposed to be gathering ahead of time names. And I see this on Facebook all the time. If anyone is making challah, please include the name of so-and-so when you make challah this week. And so what, it's a very powerful act, and I have to say very emotional. One of my daughter-in-law's best best friends just went through extremely serious brain surgery this past week at Hadassah in Jerusalem. Thank God she came through it, but it was a very long, very, very scary surgery. She was a long road ahead of her, but she's, she's so far so good. There were 58 women and men around the world that made challah for her last Friday. Wow. Wow. And she didn't know it because she was already on all kinds of medication. When she woke up and she saw that, plus the 58 people, not only did she write a response to that, what it did for her, she said, I want you to know, I may never know who you are, but I am sending all my prayers to you. 
So making challah is an emotional act, a physical act, a religious act, a spiritual act, more than any, and more than baking chocolate chip cookies or brownies or sourdough bread. And so I think that that's, that's part of it too. Challah is an honor. That's how I've always felt it. It's an honor. Thanks so much, Melinda. I really You're appreciate welcome. it. I'm sorry I put you on the spot, but okay. I, knew, I, knew, I knew you would rise to the occasion. <laughs> um, are there any other questions or can we wrap things up? Alana? I'm just looking. Um, Goldie, did Goldie have another? No? Yes? I think Goldie wanted to say something. Okay, I will unmute go oh I'll unmute Goldie. You're go good, ahead, Goldie. Goldie. I'm good. I just wanted to thank you. Thank you, Melinda. And it was a lovely afternoon and I thank you so much. I do have your cookbook and I bought it way before I knew you. I know so you did. I really the book impressed me before I even knew you and how impressive you were. So thank you again for the program. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Goldie. Um, I just want to remind all of you that we are going to meet again next week at 3.30. Um, we're going to bake challah. I mean, we're going to bake babka. We might get to challah some other time, but we're going to bake babka. Um, if you, if you uh, want to bake along with me, um, please make sure that you register so that Alana can send you the recipe. Because in order to do that, you need to make the dough ahead of time, at least two and a half to three hours before we're, we're gonna start to Zoom at 3.30, or you can do it the night before uh, and refrigerate it and then take it out and let it, and let it warm up to room temperature. So um, I, will make, I will make the dough along as we start the program, but then what we're going to do is we're going to make the uh, fillings and we're going to roll the dough and show you how to do that, how you cut it, how you place it in the pans, um, how you place it in different pans. Um, you're gonna get a, a little note that tells you um, if you don't have uh, loaf pans, uh, different kinds of pans that you can use. Thank you to Laura for asking that question. And um, so, and if you have any questions after you've looked at the recipe, um, please feel free to get back to me. My email address um, and uh, is going to be on the note. So I look forward to seeing all of you next week. I thank you all for coming. Again, happy anniversary, Jan and Bob. And mm -hmm. nice to see some people from all over and Lily from all the way from South America. Just so wonderful to see you. Hope to see you all next week. Um, Barbara, we... Go ahead. We actually have two last comments. <laughs> okay. If we have a little time. Melinda and then Nina. Okay. I just wanted to say one quick thing. The association between the Kiefer family and Barbara Wasser goes back decades. Barbara and her crew catered our son's bar mitzvah in Schenectady in 1991. Uh -huh. The Friday night dinner, the Shabbos lunch for the whole congregation, a party Saturday night, a brunch in our house. And I remember Barbara saying to our son, who's now 41 years old, father of four, what is it that you like to eat on Shabbat? What are your favorite foods? And I have to say, Barbara, I don't know if I ever told you how empowering that was to a 12 and a half year old to be asked his opinion. I didn't even think to ask his opinion. And the food was superb. So our, we can give Barbara the stamp of approval on all kinds of foods. So thank you, Barbara. Thanks, Melinda, appreciate that. Go ahead, Nina. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank you, Barbara, for your time. This was great, great way to spend an afternoon. I think you should give the name of your book again in case there's anybody on who doesn't have your book and would like it. And the third thing is if we registered for uh, the program next week, when is the recipe gonna be sent out? Because I didn't get the recipe and I wanna make sure I have all the ingredients. So I just received the recipe, so I will send it out to everyone Perfect. that has registered tomorrow. 
and I encourage anyone that has not registered to please go on the Beth Om website and register so that then I can get you the recipe immediately. Yeah, we need the ingredients. Okay. Yes. My book is called Divine Kosher Cuisine. I am the co-author along with Risa Rautenberg. Um, we uh, co-chaired uh, catering for eight years together. And then we were tired of people coming into the kitchen from New York and Canada and wherever <laughs> saying, can we have the recipe for X, Y, Z? And we said, well, it's proprietary, but someday maybe we'll write a cookbook. So we okay. both retired from catering and we sat down on our tushes for two years and wrote wrote this cookbook. It is called Divine Kosher Cuisine. Um, I do have copies. Um, they are $15 now. They were a $32.95 book. If any of you wish a book, you can be in touch with me. As I said, my email is on the, um, <clears throat> will be on the letter that you get with the, with the babka. Okay. Barbara, thank you so much. This was a fabulous afternoon. We had close to 60 participants which is very exciting. And we're looking forward to making babka next Sunday at the same time. I also want to remind everyone that this coming Tuesday at 7 p.m., Rabbi Kiefer is gonna do the first in his three-part series, Crossroads in Jewish History. The topic for this week is Masada versus Yavna. And I'm going to unmute everyone now so that whoever would like to can stay in chat before Minion begins. Thank you. thank you everyone for coming. And thank you again, Barbara. It was just fabulous. Thank you all for coming. It was great. And thanks Ken and Alana for being the co-host. <laughs> it's our pleasure. <laughs> I'm going to stop the recording, Alana. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Okay. Uh, thank you, young lady, for unmuting me. I just